Founders Floor, a co-working accelerator for startups. So by way of background, uh, you were a founder, uh, VC, and then a successful professor. Um, so now, yeah, maybe you can just start off by telling us how your collective experiences have really shaped your view on, on startups and life in general. Uh, sure, small question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, we only have an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> um, in some ways, all those three levels that you were just talking about were very formative. Uh, they were the first-hand experiences that I had, getting to know a bunch of the things that founders face, but not realizing their importance at that time. I, as a founder, I thought, and I've found since then, that a lot of founders think, this is unique, I'm the only one facing this. This is not something that I am going to be able to go out and find universalisms that I can go and find rules of thumb to go by. Um, and even what I've found since then is that a lot of the rules of thumb are misleading and wrong. Uh, that's what a bit of the research is focused on. But essentially I had some seeds planted when I was founding. Then I got a bit of a broader perspective on it when I was doing VC. And at that point, that's when it started hitting me about what I had experienced was actually much more universal. So having founding team after founding team come through, talking to them about their backstories, about the dilemmas they were grappling with, starting to see where those were connected to some outcomes. These kinds of teams tend to be more shaky. These tends of teams, these kinds of teams, how they came together, how they architected it, seems to impress me more, et cetera. And having reflections that told me that, wait, my experiences actually have much more representativeness within founding um, than what I had expected originally. Then when I was heading into academia, I went looking for answers to all of these things that I had grappled with. Uh, what do we know about all of these open questions that I had seen? And academia knew nothing about it. Nothing systematic, nothing that was rigorous, that had been, a, there had been essentially a bunch of case studies that had been written and that was about it. There was no data, there was, and if anything, uh, one of the things that I came to appreciate is that because academics hadn't experienced it themselves, they didn't even know what the right questions to ask were. Right? For them to get data and test hypotheses, you have to know what questions you want to go and test for. And they were making all sorts of assumptions that a startup is a small version of a Fortune 500 company. We know everything we need to know about Fortune 500. That's where the research has been. So let's just go and extrapolate it down to a startup. A founder CEO is just an earlier stage of Fortune 500 CEO. And from my own experiences and from talking to the teams and things like that, I realized that some of the things were actually the opposite of what the assumptions were that they were making, the things that they had found uh, within the large companies. And so I decided if anyone's going to go and make those inroads, I'm going to have to go and dive in and do that. And so as I was wading into it, I started seeing how can I go and get my own data? How can I go and concretize all the things that I've seen that we should go and tackle with it? How can I go and work with founders to go and understand beyond my sample of it and go and do a bunch of very deep case studies on them to go and do it? And so all those three levels that you're highlighting actually are what culminated in my seeing the importance of it, what questions to ask to get at those pieces, and then how we can go and educate the next generation of founders about those answers. And so your data, is, is based on, what, about 10,000, 20,000 entrepreneurs? Stop. So back when I did the first book, Founders Dilemmas was based on the first 10,000 that I collected. Um, since then, it's been a decade, and so I now have another 10,000. Um, and it's just about every single thing that I wanted to know inside the startup, so much of which had never been tackled before around the team and its prior relationships, its prior experience it was bringing to the venture, how they came together, how did they architect the team, the roles, the relationships, the rewards, the equity splits, um, how they financed it if they did, uh, how did they build the board of directors, all of these other pieces of it that all coalesce into whether the startup is going to be able to succeed or not. And uh, focusing on a variety of different levels of analyses and being able to go and see what leads teams to blow up versus be stable. What leads the founder to being fired as the parent of her baby versus she can go and be sustained throughout it. What are the things that foster growth versus what are the things that torpedo growth? If we can go and use a whole bunch of the very strong tools of econometrics, but then marry it with knowledge of the phenomenon and being out there in the field, that's where we can have the two of them come together to paint that full landscape. So we're just going to start at the beginning. And, and, and a question that I get all the time, I think, is something that you, you highlight in your book. And that is, you know, I've got clients that are working for large corporations or they, uh, and they have a startup on the side or they 
are thinking about quitting their company to, um, to start their startup. And I think one of the things that I, that I recall from your book and reading it again in anticipation of this, you talk about um, you know, deciding when to go is a really tough decision and it's probably one of the early, early stage dilemmas. You've got a great job. Um, and you may not have enough experience to really tackle the rigors of, uh, of a startup on the one hand, but the only, on the other hand, the longer you wait and to get that, that, that skill and experience to be the fearless leader, you may have you know, too many handcuffs, you know, kids and wives and colleges. So, so how do you know when it's the right time um, for those entrepreneurs that, that are working for, for big enterprise right now you know, when is it the right time to go? And, and what, are the, what's, what are the things they should be thinking about as they consider making the leap? Mm -hmm. So no, in some ways, it's a, very, it's a great universal question for us to go and kick off on because it's not just for founders. This is when you're talking about the, the lessons that we can learn from founders for the rest of our lives. That applies any time that we are trying to go and shift gears at a key inflection point in life. And two of the key things that um, uh, are in some ways opposite poles that are battling our going and being able to shift gears. One of them is passion, and the other one is the handcuffs that you were talking about. Um, a lot of times people get very passionate about an idea, lightning strikes, you wanna go and pursue it. Or you've had a lifelong dream, let's getting, getting out of the founding realm more into the life as a startup kind of a realm. Um, you've always dreamed of being able to do something in a nonprofit space, that you wanna go and have the social enterprise side of you contribute to the world and things like that. That's shifting gears in also a pretty dramatic way into that new realm. And a lot of times your passion for shifting into the nonprofit space or going and doing founding is gonna lead you to go and make bad decisions about how you're gonna go and do it. So uh, to go in first within the founding realm, um, but what I found in general is that there are three areas that you have to go and consider when you are going to, and unfortunately, you tend to only think about one of them when you are a founder. There's the market circumstances. You get an idea, this great idea that you wanna go and see brought to the world. And one of the things you have to go and consider is the market circumstances, are they favorable or not? Then there's the career circumstances, are those favorable or not? And then there's the personal circumstances, are those favorable or not? And a big problem with the passion is that you're gonna misread all three of those potentially at your peril. What you are gonna do is you're gonna think that because I love this idea, because I would be willing to pay for it, there must be a vast market out there that also wants it. And you're gonna be skewing your decisions in the direction, the passion is gonna be clouding, your clear evaluation of that. That's one of the key things over the last decade that in a lot of ways, Lean Startup, Eric Reese has gone and done a great job at having us think in a more structured way about how to make sure that your passion isn't clouding, you're looking at the market and whether it's favorable or not. But then your passion is also gonna mislead you about the other two pieces of it. You've never founded before. Do you even know what career experiences are critical to have a solid foundation for being able to go and found? Do you know what six months in the skills are gonna be that you didn't need at the beginning as you're painting uh, this picture for yourself of how you are prepared for founding? You've got all sorts of uncertainties and you're gonna be skewing, the passion is gonna be skewing in the direction of, yeah, I can give a thumbs up for to those circumstances. And then the same thing with the personal circumstances, going in, uh, pushing that aside, uh, talking about the stage of life, is it gonna be favorable? Um, have I gone and taken on a bunch of things that are gonna turn out to be those handcuffs you are talking about? Um, all of these decisions that make all the perfect sense in the world when we are making them. So uh, you've been a student, living the life of a starving student on ramen noodles. Now, finally, you are graduating. You are having a real job. You have a signing bonus for that job. Now we can start life. Well, let's go and take that signing bonus and pay for the down payment on that mortgage. Uh, let's go and get a nanny to be able to go and help with the kids. Let's go and pay for private schools for the kids. All of these things that you're going and layering on as commitments that you're making, to take a term out of the startup realm, you're taking on a very high personal burn rate that is gonna be what is the life that you're gonna be going and living. And yet, you're gonna be looking at this through your passion as saying, we can handle it. I can go and take no paycheck for a while. We can, uh, ramen noodles, what we're gonna feed the baby is gonna be a jar of them every day. Uh, all sorts of ways in which the passion is gonna be, I really wanna pursue this idea, and you're gonna diss the personal side of it. And unfortunately, when we go, and especially that last one, not consider what it's gonna do on the personal side, then that's gonna cause a whole bunch of problems when you just need the support the most 
from the most critical players in your life, the family side of it, that you will have gone and blown up the, the ability to go and have that as your support thing. And so the perils of passion, they're gonna misread each of those circumstances. The more you can have a clear picture of those, be able to see which ones of those um, aren't favorable, and then even more so that you're not waiting until the last minute to go and evaluate this, because with the luxury of time, you can go and make each of these more, more, uh, more favorable for yourself. If you go and you look at all the things I'm missing on my career checklist, and actually I'm missing a couple of things that'll be what I need to go and found and succeed, with a couple of years worth, you can go and plot a path to going and reinforcing those. If it's that your network is missing in some areas, you can go and start coming to events like this and building your network to be able to get stronger in that. On the personal side, being able to go and maybe scale back a bit, being able to go and have a lower personal burn rate so you can save up some of that seed money that you're gonna need, some of the cushion that you're gonna need to be able to go and reduce the, the risks on the family side. Maybe you go and scale up, move into a smaller house or give up the mortgage to start rent, et cetera, like a bunch of ways in which you can go and live like a founder before you are founding. And then it's gonna be a much more favorable family situation, not gonna be a shock to the system to uh, be going and scaling back right at that point. And so with the luxury of time, with the foresight, and with the clearer evaluation that what your passion is gonna to lead to, then you're gonna be able to do a much better side of being able to go and evaluate when is the right time to leap. The other danger on the other side is if you're waiting for everything to line up, if you're waiting for three out of three on all of those, it's entirely possible you're gonna to come to the end of your career never having had the perfect happen for you, and you're gonna regret never having impacted the world through that. You're gonna regret not going and testing yourself and seeing whether you could push yourself in that realm. Um, and so that's where you have to think incrementally as we're making each of those decisions about take on the mortgage, take on the nanny, take on the high personal burn rate about whether those handcuffs over time are gonna preclude me from taking a low paying nonprofit job than being able to go and achieve my dream there or becoming that founder who isn't gonna be able to go and get a paycheck on the other side of it. It, it was really interesting. I, I don't know if uh, uh, any folks here came to the fireside with David Gurley. Uh, he's the CEO of Symphony. He had a you know a really great job at Microsoft, uh, reporting to Bomber and Gates. And when I started reading Noam's new book, "This Life as a Startup," um, how we can kind of learn from startup founders, it was really interesting. Um, David wanted to do a startup, and he came home one night, said to his wife, "I want to do a startup," and she said, "You're crazy. You've got a great job at Microsoft." You know, why do you want to do this? And he just said, look, I, I'm totally passionate about it. And he pulled out a spreadsheet. He basically, you know, had the whole thing outlined for two years, taking no money, uh, paying four developers. You know, what would it take to, you know, what, what would the burn be in his life? And um, so he's sold his house in Palo Alto, sold his cars, moved into a little place. Um, you know, just, just what yeah. you're saying. And I started thinking about that, and as I was reading your new book, I mean, the guy was really pitching his wife. I mean, he was, it was like pitching an investor. He had the deck. He had the spreadsheet. This is what we need to do. This is how long we, we can go without, without salary. And it really, it really is amazing. As you start thinking more and more about this, how, um, how you know, what we do can really be influenced about how you know, entrepreneurs uh, deal with certain things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to go and adjust a little bit in terms of that, you're exactly right in terms of that fitting in perfectly to that. When you're talking about pitching the wife, there's a whole bunch of dangers with that also. <laughs> um, this is where that passion is also going to come back to haunt you. There are perils to it. Because if it is that you're in pitch mode, you're gonna be selling her on why you should be doing this, rather than educating, and that pitching is gonna be looking at the rosy scenario. Honey, when we go and conquer the world, then this is gonna be glorious for us. Um, when we go and raise that round, we won't have to go and suffer with the ramen noodle baby jar. Uh, all these other things that are gonna be more in sell mode with the pitching. It's at that point that you have to go and push your passion down and head into education mode. Go and be educating her about, yes, there are pitfalls here. There are all sorts of risks that you don't know enough yet about it because you're not familiar with the entrepreneurial sector and things like that. Let me go and tell you about some of the bumps in the road that I'm likely to face. And you have to go and take on the onus of the education to be able to go and have her buy into because if it's all rosy that you're painting for her, what are the chances that you're gonna hit a bump in the road? It's a given. When you first hit that bump, she's gonna be coming back and saying, what happened to that glorious picture that you were painting for me? And the entire support is gonna come crashing down. You would have gone and created a very fragile 
set of support from her. If you've gone and educated her about the bumps, talk to her about it. it. Sounds like he was going and mapping out the risks, and now here's my solutions to it. Then it's far more effective at being able to go and build a whole bunch of these support and forcing you to do some of your thinking. Hopefully, the spouse is going and pushing you on the things she's not understanding to make sure that you're thinking as deeply about these from the fresh eyes perspective that the spouse can go and bring to it. And so, the, the one piece of it I would say is hopefully not in pitch mode, not in sell mode, not in twist arm mode, but far more in the education mode to go and make that a much more solid foundation of support. Just in contrast to another founder who called me up, you know, just all terribly excited at a, a big job, $500,000 a year with, with bonus. Called me up and said, Roger, I'm so excited to tell you I quit my job. I said, oh, that's fantastic because that's a real commitment to, to a startup. When you're going to you know, quit a $500,000 a year job. I said, uh, what did your wife, wife have to say? He said, I haven't told her yet. <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of the antithesis. Of that. So the Procopio uh, divorce attorneys were getting someone the next week. <laughs> we encourage all of our founders not to talk to their wives. Um, no, I'm kidding. So a, a question I get asked a lot as well, you know, as you're, you're deciding to go in and, and do your startup, is whether or not uh, someone should go in solo, start the company, um, you know, get some validation of the hypothesis, maybe try and, you know, get some level of validation, um, or should they you know, go right away and start trying to attract um, other co-founders. Uh, you know, sometimes it can be kind of an artificial decision if you want to get into an accelerator that don't take, you know, very often sole, uh, sole founders. But um, what's your take on the likelihood of success ultimately based on your data of companies that have got uh, solo founders as opposed to those that kind of come together as a cohesive group, you know, in the beginning? Yeah, so... On this one, let me start with the data, and then we can back into a little bit of the intuition behind it. Um, what my analyses of solo versus co-founded teams are is that the solo have a lower average performance than the co-founded teams, but a higher variance of performance. And what that means is that what you have is the solo founders who are armed for battle. They are able to get to about the performance because the high end of the variance, they're able to get to about the performance of the co-founded teams. But the ones who don't co-found, uh, who, who should have co-founded and go solo instead, they're much more likely to completely crater. And so that's where a bit of that self-awareness, a bit of that knowledge about am I armed for battle is a critical thing, not just for deciding whether you're going to go and leap, but whether you should go and leap on your own and be Superman and take the weight of the world on your own broad shoulders uh, to be able to go and do it all on your own. If you have gone proactively done your checklist, go back to the checklist of the readiness part that we were talking about. If you've gone and mapped that out and you've gone and proactively checked off all the key boxes there, you are suited to go and solo found. And then you can make glory happen on your own. You don't have to take on a whole bunch of these tensions that we'll probably get into around the things that blow up teams. It's pretty easy to go and negotiate an equity split with yourself. It's pretty easy to go and figure out who's going to be CEO when you're solo founding. And so you're not going to have to go and wrestle with all of those pieces yourself. But if you've gone in your passion and misread about your readiness for it, or because you don't have a roadmap of where things are likely to go, you don't understand the challenges that you are not suited for, then it's far more likely that you're going to be cratering at the bottom end of that distribution. Uh, you, great point, great point. Just one thing to go and adjust also. So when we're talking, it's far easier to talk in terms of extremes. We're talking about yeah. solo versus co found and that's going to be a bunch of things that we're going to talk about tonight. It's going to be easier to go and talk about buckets like that. But there's also a whole bunch of the in-betweens that we're going to have to neglect because it's going to take a while to get into. But you've got quasi-founders, you've got early hires that are much more in the middle there. Those are sometimes some of the solutions to uh, some of these pieces. If you, don't, if you have some of the unchecked boxes, it could be you get a co-founder, but maybe it's that you start off instead with with a very dedicated advisor who then maybe becomes more involved over time and things like that. So uh, we will be talking more in extremes, but this is one of the great cases of where there are in-betweens for that also. So um, one of the, one of the, the uh, points that you raise in the, in the book, The Founder's Dilemmas, um, it, it's going to crush, I think, a lot of uh, founders here tonight. Um, you, you bring up this notion of being rich or being a king. Uh, and I just want to read a quote from your book. It says, founders who consistently make decisions that build wealth are more likely to achieve what I call a rich outcome, which is greater financial gains and lesser control. 
while founders who consistently make decisions that enable them to maintain control of the startup are more likely to achieve what I call a king outcome, which is greater control and lesser financial gains. gains. So I think one of the premises in your book is that there are two main, uh, main motivations for getting into a startup, and one is wealth, and the other is control. Obviously, there are the, the wanting to change the world yep, uh, aspects as well. Yep. But as I read your book again, it really kind of struck me that at the very early stages, I think you have to decide, are you going to be rich or are you going to be king? And um, that translates into so many things in terms of giving up equity, the board, um, taking on investors. But I think where you come out in the book is that for the most part, probably everyone here tonight is either going to be rich or king, but they're not going to be rich and king. Um, so maybe you could just speak to these concepts and explain why for, for just about everybody here tonight it's going to be unattainable, that dream of having control and having the wealth as well. Okay, yeah, let's just take a poll here of everyone. How many of you want to be rich and king? Come on, don't lie, every single hand should be in the air here. <laughs> okay, so this is one of the things that as we're going into founding is the dream that we have. We wanna go and create something big, something that is gonna be earth shattering and impactful on the world and we wanna be the ones to be bringing it to that, to be leading the charge across the, all of that. That's very much the dream and we get misled a bit by a lot of the role models that we put up there on the pedestal as we go and take a look at that. I'm a first time founder, I'm gonna be the next Steve Jobs. I'm a first time founder, I'm gonna be the next Bill Gates. Those guys were rich and king as first time founders as they're going out and doing it. And those are the role models that we go and take a look at and see that, oh, it's very common that people are able to get to that. And first off, the data show that no. Uh, my most recent stuff, it's actually uh, much more advanced than what I had in the, the first book. The most recent analyses of it on 6,000 ventures that I did is that there is a very strong and clear trade-off between the founder keeping control beyond a certain point and the value of the venture. There's a very uh, significant hit that it does when the founder out, outstays um, that, uh, that uh, essentially beyond the point where that person is suited for where the venture goes. And we can get into a bunch of the details around what that means. Um, and a key thing is when we go and misread and say we're gonna get to that box of rich and king, we actually heighten the chances we're gonna get to neither of those. That we're gonna end up in the flop category without uh, being either rich or, or king. And a key thing, as you were, you were talking about there, that it starts from the beginning of our journey all the way up through it where we are having to, and often don't realize it, having to wrestle with being able to make those kind of trade-offs. So let me start off first with when you've decided to found, and then we can back up even to what to go and found. You're making that first decision about, am I gonna remain a solo founder, or am I gonna go and get co-founders? You go and get co-founders, you are sharing decision-making control, you are having to give up equity to attract them, you are gonna be going and making a distinct decision to not go down the path of remaining on that throne because you're gonna go and try to bring in people who are gonna be able to go and grow the kingdom a lot more. They're gonna be able to go and push with you in the direction of really realizing the potential a lot more. How are you gonna go and finance it? Well, that first round, is that gonna be bootstrapping or is that gonna be that we're gonna go and get some outside money for that? You bootstrap, you still control all the decisions, but you haven't brought in any of the resources that you need, you haven't gotten any of the value added, smart money maybe, that could go and help you fill in a bunch of your holes, versus you go and get a bunch of the outside money, you're gonna have to give up some of the equity for that, you're gonna have to give up decision-making control, you now have someone else on the board. There's all sorts of ways in which you, by going down that other path, are going very much into the direction of let me bring on a lot of resources and people to help me grow the potential, but it's gonna be with sacrificing a bunch of the, uh, the control that I have within it. Same thing when you're doing hires, you're gonna have the rock stars that you can go and attract, or the jacks of all trades, the cheap ones, you don't have to give much equity, if any, to them, and uh, to be able to go down the other path of getting the best there and attracting them. The next round of financing, et cetera, like each of these paths along the way. And so if you're going, you're solo founding, you're bootstrapping, and you're stretching with the cheap hires, you're gonna keep lots of control there, but it's gonna be, uh, in class I talk about the metaphor of, it. you could've had a wedding cake and you're gonna end up with a cupcake. It'll be all your cupcake. 
<laughs> but it'll be much less than what the hopeful potential is going to be. You go down the other path, it's on the hopes that you're going to be giving up control and risking having the ultimate giving up in control, but it's on the hope that that slice of the wedding cake that is going to be able to be grown a lot more will hopefully be more valuable than what the cupcake would have been. Um, and if you can go and make those decisions from the beginning about which am I going to celebrate at the end of the day, there's some people that it's going to be very attractive to them to have the cupcake that is all theirs. If they go down the path of co-founding and then raising a bunch of big money and going and getting the, they're going to end up having given up the control that they wanted. They are going to give up not being able to be the visionary that could keep running this thing as they're going forward with it and are going to regret, even if they got rich at the end there, they're going to go and uh, get bribed to go and give up what their dream was and their motivation. They got a little richer for it, but they're going to have all sorts of regrets. One of the core uh, cases that I have in my course is about uh, Lou Cerny, who had, uh, he's now the, uh, the founder CEO of New Relic that some of you might be familiar with, local entrepreneur here. But taking a look at Wiley Technology, when Lou was going and founding that and then got fired as CEO of, of Wiley. And when we were debuting the case, Lou had just exited. He had just become a very rich man, but his last words essentially were very telling in terms of what was motivating him. He said, next time I'm running this to a billion dollars and I don't care what any VC has to say about it. <laughs> Lots of regret, despite his having gotten rich, because he's the visionary who wants to be able to bring that impact and that product to the market, and it had very much been taken away from him. And in New Relic, we reflected on a whole bunch of the lessons he learned from that and the path he should plot on the way to it, and on almost every all of these levels that we're talking about, the team building, the investing, the board, and then the last piece of it, what he was even going and founding, was very different than Wiley, where he could go and structure it and play to his strengths and uh, not have to go and give up a bunch of that control. And so that's where if we can go and plot this path from the beginning, understanding ourselves, if you are going and you want to keep control and you're looking at all your opportunities to go. This is getting into the what to found. And number one on your list is something that's going to be very resource intensive. Number two on your list, not as attractive, is something you can go and bootstrap and that is not going to need a lot of resources. Well, maybe if you're in sync with what you want to go and celebrate at the end of the day, that you're going to be much more keeping in control. The cupcake is what you want to be able to go and do. Then go for your number two thing on your list. Go for the one that's going to be in sync with you and not have you regretting it like Lou was at the end of that journey. And so that's where even backing up to what am I going to found and then plotting a strategic path to go and reinforce getting to the, 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 the outcome that you're going to go and celebrate is why taking a conscious look through all of these stages is going to enable you to, to balance the rich and king pieces of it. Although, you know, uh, a, a lot of founders will say, hey, uh, I'm OK giving up control because I want the wedding cake. Um, but the reality is, if you don't give up control in a controlled way and in a smart way, um, ultimately, you can end up with a cupcake anyway and have less, less, less equity, less control, and a cupcake, which is, which is really sad. And we'll get, in, get into some of those things um, uh, in, in a few minutes. But as you look at the entrepreneurs, maybe like Zuckerberg, you know, the, the rare entrepreneurs that are both King and and um, and rich. Are there any characteristics of the entrepreneur or the markets they're addressing? Anything that you can say? You know, I kind of knew that he or she would probably be rich or king. I mean, anything just on the on the human side that you've identified? Well, so we can get a little bit back into Lou's story because he got to Rich and King and New Relic um, with that. Uh, but let me go back up. You remind me about one thing that uh, we were talking about those two examples about Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, first time entrepreneur, I'm going to be them. Um, in class, I use that um, to go and be able to see how many of you guys want to be that as that first time entrepreneur. And there's a reason why I am using those two names. They don't even satisfy the test themselves a first time entre entrepreneur who became rich and king. Steve Jobs was not king of Apple for the first 20 years of its life. The first, the, the first one who was the investor at Apple, Mike Markula, he intentionally brought in Mike Scott to be the CEO with a mandate that Steve Jobs has to be kept in a box because he could go and blow up this entire company himself. And so there's all sorts of ways in which we have misnomers about we should celebrate him for lots of other things, but not for this piece of it. He was not rich and king throughout uh, the, even the beginning years of Apple. Bill Gates doesn't satisfy it either. Microsoft was his third company. He was not a first-time founder when he did it. He and Paul Allen, dear Paul Allen, um, uh, 
they founded Trafo data before they even went. They learned a bunch of things from that. They were able to go, but neither of those guys that we were using as the ones that are up on the pedestal that we all want to be like were able to go and satisfy it. Zuckerberg definitely does. So first time founder who was going and doing it. And that is a bit of skill, a bit of luck that is all coming together into those. Um, as you go and take a look at a bunch of the things that were going on, in some ways he emphasizes how even in those glorious stories of the rare ones who get too rich and king, there's lots of ways in which they were skating to a cliff and just pulling themselves back right before they're doing. They are also facing a bunch of pitfalls, a bunch of dilemmas. Who's, who has seen social network here? I assume this is everyone about weekly is having viewings around here on that. Why did that movie exist? Because he blew it on the equity split. He went and did a bad, and we'll get into it, I assume, I know it's yeah. one of your favorite topics, the equity split side of it. But he went and did a bad job of splitting the equity, and that could have completely imperiled the company because he went and did that. That movie would not exist if not for the fact that he was skidding on very thin ice, making a typical equity split mistake at that, pro at that point. And the fact that he survived out of it, this, the lesson that we take out of it isn't that we should go and do bad equity splits. Is that it does take a little bit of luck to be able to go and get yourself through the, the typical problems there. I would very much assume on his next company, if there's going to be one, that he's far more educated about how he's going to split the equity and a bunch of other things uh, that he took away from it. He got you know, the, the skill and luck turned into a glorious company. But there's all sorts of other ways in which it is very much a high risk way to go if you are not informed about the road ahead and being able to go and make the better decisions there. <laughs> So <clears throat> we're going to get into some of the founders, the true founders' dilemmas. Um, and your work was spurred on in large part by, I think it was Professor Salman, who was also at Harvard. And I, from what I recall, he was looking at VCs and their portfolio companies and trying to identify why sort of high growth, uh, growth potential startups failed. And um, one of his conclusions was that about 65% of the time, it really was you know, to do with people problems. Um, the interpersonal relationships and tensions uh, between the team, and you've kind of broken it down into the, the three R's, which we're going to talk about. The first is the relationship problems. The second is uh, are the roles and the, the misalignment of the roles, and then the third is the inappropriate rewards, which is splitting the pie. So just before we get into that, one of the things that I also found a little counterintuitive um, was let's assume that we now resigned ourselves that we're not going to be rich and king. We're going to just be rich, and so we're going to take on co-founders and uh, have the right investors and, and so forth. Um, one of the things that you say is that people have this tendency, and I think it, uh, you, you mentioned homophily, uh, uh, where people tend to congregate on people that are like-minded, you know, like, like themselves in so many different ways, they're attracting people. And one of the things you say, where it's a background in age and experience and that kind of thing, those people that bring people together like themselves, uh, are going to be less successful. It seems to be sort of counterintuitive. Maybe you could just speak to that a little bit. Sure. Now, the homophily, just to go a little bit, it's a horrible academic term that we need a new one for, a little bit more marketing uh, that we have to think about how to talk about it. But it's essentially birds of a feather flocking together. Now, we feel much more comfortable with people who share a background, share a similar way of looking at the world as we do. Um, and it's a very powerful magnetic pull that we have as humans. This also gets into it's a little bit of a microcosm of uh, that these issues that I was talking about from the founding perspective and first book, they're human issues that are preponderant in all sorts of other walks of our lives. Um, and so, for instance, I um, uh, ju just recently I did a Forbes column on political homophily about how we all succumb to it. If you think about, and this is where I don't get political in anything, but this is the first time I've ever written something politically. Uh, this is at the heights of the Supreme Court uh, hearings that we were just having here. And it was pointing out how uh, homophily is what we are also coming to politically. If you are on either side of where that was coming out, you probably have been in a process of going and shutting down all the voices that were disagreeing with you. We have a tendency to go and only look at the sites that are going and 
agreeing with us with every side we are on. We are unfriending the people who are not of our similar thinking. We are only listening. We're creating our own echo chamber. And that is homophily in, the, uh, in our personal lives that we are only going and seeing that one side of it. And in that column, I was pushing people that if you couldn't imagine why either of those sides still has people who believe that that was the correct side in it, go and find at least one site from the other side and go and start reading it because you have gone and intentionally shut that off because of that natural pull towards the people who agree with you. And so go and inform yourself. This, we have an election that's coming out three weeks from now. Become a better voter by going right now, and whichever side of the spectrum you're on, find something that's on the other side that you can go and read and be a lot more informed about what the other side is saying about it. You might find that you get even more dedicated to what you're saying, or you might see that you're going to see other pieces of it where the homophily, the political homophily, was leading you to miss them. Either way, you're better for it, and we as a society are better for it. And so this is one of those microcosms. That, uh, life is a startup. I go into a bunch of the data that we have from the 2016 election on how People were only listening to the people who were on their side of the political spectrum, and it was almost exactly equal. That 75% of the Clinton voters and about 75% of the Trump voters were only listening to people who were on that side of it, and did not listen to anyone who was on the other side of it. It's a human thing. It's not you know, biased towards one political side or the other. It's a human element, and that's why we see it equally on both sides of that. But um, you would think so in a startup that, that that would be a good thing, right? The people that are you know, very similar in so many respects, but they're less successful. So when you go and take a look, let's go back to that checklist. Yeah. We're talking about what are the things that I need to do to be able to go and succeed within this venture. Uh, let me go and take one example. So one of my, uh, another one of my case protagonists, another one of the people I work closely with, uh, go and study him and then capture it in class, bring him in class and have him affect everyone. Tim Westergren, people familiar with Tim? So founder CEO of Pandora. And the early days of Pandora, they were called Savage Beast. It's one of my favorite case names, to have Savage Beast as the name of the case. Um, and go into a whole bunch of the ways in which he was going and founding it. He was a musician. For a while, Bill, he was the, the Yellowwood Junction was his band. He was, that was the beginning part of his life. And that's when he got the idea for the music genome, to be able to go and have a struggling new bands, have people be able to find them who might like their music. Go and find, get a, a taste of the ones that People know that they like, and then try to match them to ones that have a similar genome, and then they'll go and do it. He's going and founding this online music company. Who's the logical one that he would go and talk about this idea with, and go and maybe partner with? Who do you think it would be a logical one to go and look at? Another musician. He's going to go to his buddies, or going to go. He's going to toss it over. Let's go and co-found this together. If you take a look at the checklist that Tim had, and this is latently within there, but an online music company. Online, we need someone tech. Music, we need someone music. Company, we need someone who knows the business side. If Tim would have gone and double checked off the music box and then not gone and fill in the other two boxes, would you even go and invest in that company? Is that anything that would be something attractive to anyone to go and join as a hire, to go and this is a double check box where he's coming to the homophily. The people who are like me, the ones that I find uh, that it's a lot harder to go and even know where to look for the ones who aren't like you, let alone be able to relate to them and then be able to see how you're going to fit and things like that. Tim, fortunately, implicitly had that checklist in his mind of, I've checked off that box already. I'm not going to go and get someone else on board with that. What I'm looking for is where can I find a business person who's going to be able to fill that in. He went and found John Kraft. He tapped a second order network of his, had been there, done that. CEO who could go and fill that in. And then also had a little bit of the glue because John had his own personal interest in music. He knew that he didn't know music to the extent Tim did, so he was giving Tim all of the, um, the, the music domain to be able to go and make those decisions. And then they went and found the person who go and check off the techie box. And so that's where, if they had gone, when you're talking about the hom homophilic teams, they're going to be early on, we're kumbaya together. We know we speak the same language. We have the cultural fit. We feel much more comfortable together. But that's going to lead to two problems. The double check boxes lead to a lot more tensions. Both of the musicians are going to want to make the music calls on which decisions they're making there. And then the unchecked boxes on that checklist are going to leave gaping holes in the team that are also going to imperil it. And so there's all sorts of ways in which you shouldn't go to the other end of the extreme. Diversity for just diversity's sake, it's going to be a lot more of the tensions that are going to be coming. But that mid-range of pushing ourselves out of homophily and being able to go and see what are the big gaping holes that we haven't filled, that's where you have to go and get yourself a much more, much more used to it. Um, this is also one of the things you wouldn't have seen in Founders Dilemmas, but now in, the, in Life as a Startup, go tap some of the, uh, the, the research on grumpy orchestras. 
that a lot of times you go and think about that the uh, that this orchestra all getting to all getting along really well kumbaya within the orchestra they're going to play beautiful music as you know the research shows that the orchestras that have at least a little bit of grumpiness to them, there is a little bit of the creative tension, there is a little bit of the diversity there that is going and uh, not making it all kumbaya, they actually play better. And we have to get comfortable ourselves in our personal lives and our founding lives with a little bit of building those muscles around how do we go and harness the creative tension rather than run the other direction and have homophily become the rule within our teams. So let's talk a little bit about the relationships. Um, I think this is, this is the first of your three R's. And you say when people found companies, there's essentially three camps that they can sort of pull their co-founder pool from. The one is sort of the friends and family, close personal relationships. Um, there are sort of the mere acquaintances, and then there are, there are the former co-workers. So instinctively, you would think that the folks that you are friendly with, family, um, you would think that those are the, the folks that would be most likely to succeed. But your research has shown that it really is the opposite. Those are the, the friends and family are the least likely to succeed. Can you maybe talk a little bit about the data and, and which teams are most likely to succeed? Sure, no, absolutely. So I should have stopped you as you were heading into that question and gone and taken a poll here. So forget what Roger just said about the research results. How many of you would have said, think about the teams that are the friends and family versus the other teams? the teams that you don't have that social relationship with, and which would be more stable. How many people would say that the friends and family teams, the people you know well, that you trust, that those are gonna be more stable? How many people would say? Okay, good, we have a few hands here. Okay, how many people say no, it's gonna be the other teams? Wow, sea of hands. Uh, I gave it away. <laughs> so that's what I actually get when I go and teach this, when, before I go and read. So no, that's actually pretty universal. That's not the surprising thing about it. Like we've all, experience a lot of the tensions around it and all the challenges that you face when you have the friends and families teams. So let me ask you the second piece that to me was the eye-opening part. Which is the more common source of co-founders? Friends and family or all the rest? Friends and family. But wait, we are going and making the most perilous of decisions when we are going and founding and that is the most common of them. There's a disconnect there, there's a real problem. When we're going following our gut, when we're going and following what seems right, when we're succumbing to the people who are near and dear to us and we're compatible with it, that is the most perilous of the decisions when we're just going and doing it unthinkingly. And so when you're going and breaking it down, that's the real problem, that's a microcosm for me of when we're not thinking with our head, and this gets into my favorite Steve Jobs quote, um, follow your heart but check it with your head. <laughs> And unfortunately, when we are going and following our passion, when we're going and following our gut, we celebrate the intuitive, the instinctive entrepreneur, the founder who is going and following the gut. When it comes to these people issues that we are talking about, we are often misled by the gut. What, we, what feels right when it comes to these people decisions, who to go and co-found with, how to split the roles in equity, all these other things there, what that shows, what the research shows, is that those are the most ill-fated of decisions. And you were talking before about Bill Salmon's result that sparked my having an interest in this. Um, what Bill had gone and studied, Bill's an economist, and Bill was going and trying to study VCs and what do they do, and also fortunately thought to ask in this very long paper that he had about, tell us about the parts of your portfolio that we'll never hear about again, the ones that failed. The highest potential of ventures, they attracted VC dollars, but they hit the dustbin of history for some reason. And when Bill went in to go and categorize what are the reasons for failure, it's actually right at the alley what Christy was talking about before. Um, when Bill was taking a look at it, he was expecting things like what today, this is a paper that was published 30 years ago, so they didn't have the same lingo, but today we would call product market fit issues, uh, problems within the functions that have to coalesce as a team is coming together. And he did find that 35% of the reasons for failure were those. That was swamped by the number one reason for failure. Number one reason for failure, 65%, was the people problems. It was the frictions between the co-founders, the tensions between them and all the other people who came on board. It was those soft, squishy, subjective human issues that were the ones that were bringing down these highest potential of companies. And so when we're going, what is the reason that that is the highest reason for failure? Boy, to me, this is what motivated for me. If we wanna go and change that high rate of failure, where we can go and really move the needle is on the biggest reason for failure. So the 65% slice of this pie, if we can go and understand all those people problems and then reduce those risks to be able to go and have founders make better decisions when it comes to that, then it's gonna be far better. The problem is when we follow our gut, 
Though that gut leads to the highest risks of decisions, the friends and family founding, and then the other things that we might get into with the roles and the rewards and things like that. And so that's where we have to go and pull back on it and realize that those are much shakier. To me, the most shocking piece of it when I was doing those analyses around the types of teams is that the friends and family teams were even less stable than the stranger teams or the acquaintance teams. And then the ones, the ones I, was, I was expecting, that the co-founder, the, the, co the prior co-worker teams, they had ironed out everything in the professional realm and things like that, that that was the most stable of all the teams. But to me, the shocker was that the people who trust and know each other so well, kumbaya is going to break out as we go and create this glorious team of co-founding with my best friend or my sister, and things along those lines. Um, and that turns out to be even worse than the teams that don't know each other. And then we can go and break down what are a bunch of the risks that they are taking on. Once we know those risks, then we can go and diagnose actions you should take. Some of the risks, how many people really look forward to having really tension-filled conversations with those that are closest to you? <laughs> Lots of people, right? <laughs> yeah. Very much so we shy away from having those tension-filled conversations. Are you more likely to have that conversation with someone you know you don't know? A stranger, an acquaintance? Yeah, you know that I have to go and date that person. You know, I have to go and feel my way through about whether we're compatible and things like that. You're going to make a bold assumption with the people who are closest to you that we are compatible. We know each other. We have the trust. And you're not going to date them. It's a little weird. This is one of the titles on one of the sections in Life is a Startup, but dating mom as you're deciding whether you're going to go and co-found with mom. You have to go and step back to going and seeing whether in this different realm of life we've dealt with each other in a personal life it doesn't matter. How many people have gone to work with one of their parents? Has anyone gone to take your child to work? How similar was mom at home to how she is in the office? Was that the same person? Say a lot of heads, no. We go and make that bold assumption that if we know them really well at home, it's going to port to the office. It's going to be the same person. It's going to be the same dynamic and things like that. And then we are going to get haunted by the most treasured assumption that we have that we're going to be a glorious team in the office together when you realize this very different compartment of life has a very different person there. And that's one of the ways in which that trust and that assumption that we know each other is going to come crashing down and cause major problems for those friends and family teams. And so that's just one example of diagnose a bunch of the risks. We're not going to discuss the difficult issues as well with those types of people. When things blow up, the damage that it's going to do to the personal relationship is going to be even more severe. That's going to lead us even more so to not bring up the tough things, but each of those leads to actions you can go and take. Force a bunch of those difficult conversations. Inject a third party in who's going to go be able to tell you these are the perils that you're not discussing right now that you have to go and talk about. Go and create firewalls to go and protect the personal side when the business is blowing up. The equivalent of a prenup. Go and get Procopio to go and do a prenup that's going to protect the venture or the home from the other one blowing up. And that's something, I can go and take a show of hands, I don't want to embarrass anyone here or myself. Of the married people here, how many of you have a prenup agreement? Hasn't everyone heard that 50% of marriages fail? <laughs> oh, but we're going to be the rosy marriages that are going to be able to go and avoid the, 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 the glorious marriages we're never going to be. Well, the same thing that we do within teams. Back to life as a startup, the, parent, the similarity that we have, all sorts of metaphors of home life and startup life, the co-founder of life, the my baby, and things along those lines. You have the high rate of failure within startups. You have the high rate of failure within marriages. We're going to assume that away because we're going to be the rosy, glorious teams and then never have to go and deal with it. Those same human things that lead us to go and not have the conversations, not craft these firewalls when we're playing with fire by going and uh, doing a friends and family co-founding team, we have to go and take a bunch of those actionable steps that we usually neglect and that is going to be a lot more healthy for us to go and do that. It just kind of goes against human nature, right? Because we typically, just human nature is we don't want to have confrontations. And it's people that we're going to be you know, close to and sitting around the Thanksgiving table with. So you know, great advice. I, I want to just switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about, about roles and responsibilities. And I think one of the things that I got from your, your book is that um, Really finding the right division of labor uh, in the founding team can be a really big source of tension. And um, especially when it comes to titles, uh, whether there are overlapping roles and responsibilities, are there, is there going to be collective decision making? And you know, will that really end up in gridlock? So um, 
just a couple of questions now on roles and responsibilities. I get this question a lot. Um, who should be the CEO? Is it necessarily the idea guy or gal, or is it somebody else? Who, in your view, should be the CEO? Okay, so let's see here also where people come out on idea person and CEO and things like that. So how many people say that the person who ha the idea person at the right at the beginning should probably still be the CEO three years out? Do you think that that would be that? There's similarity between what is a good idea person and what's going to be a good three-year CEO? Or more different? Okay, so it's going to be pretty different down the road there. And yet, in the data, the idea person is four, more t four times as likely to have the CEO position as a non-idea person. And yet, there's going to be all sorts of ways in which there's going to be the inertia of that position you go and have titles early on, people go and fall in love with that title. They fall in love with the position. There's gonna be all sorts of ways in which that human element of the social inertia of the prestige, the status, and things like that is gonna to lead to down the road if you didn't have a difficult discussion with the idea person about why that isn't the right person to be taking on that title for a little bit longer for the duration and things like that. That's gonna cause major tensions later when that person is not suited for it, but they've fallen in love with the time that they've been in there, they love that business card, it passes the mom test. Mom loves bragging about her son, the, the CEO, or her daughter, the CEO. All sorts of ways in which there's gonna be tensions later on because of it. That idea person early on who is just taking the CEO title, and it's not with the consideration of CEO is not the same thing as idea person, is gonna cause tensions for the team as it's going forward into it. Sometimes you do have the right person had both the idea and later on, but it's a rare person who's gonna be that. And so it has to be much more with that consideration of it. And even if you do have that, that person's taking it on initially, it has to be with a very strong and reiterated understanding that this is temporary. Not quite that you're going and putting interim CEO on the founder CEO's card, but that effectively there are the conversations with them over time. Let's reevaluate. What are the things that are the next stages of what the CEO's gonna to have to do well and does this match the checklist that we created for you back in the beginning of our journey about what you do well? Is there a disconnect between those two pieces of it? And that's where you have to go and consistently have com communication about it. Otherwise, that person's gonna fall in love with it and it's gonna be a, an assumption that I'm gonna be able to continue with that. It's hard because people get attached to the, to the title. You're absolutely right. Um, so we've got the, got the right CEO at the right time. Um, I get this a lot as well. What decisions should be made by the CEO, and especially we're talking the early stage, and which decisions should be made as a team? What, what's your advice here? So the most effective, so let's get back to the hybrid approaches and things like that, because you're talking about Rich and King. That the, um, uh, Let's go back to Tim Westergren as the example also. Um, uh, the, uh, the, so talking about King, another metaphor that we use is living, being Zeus in Mount Olympus, the person at the top of the mountain is very clearly making all of the decisions and those orders versus living in Neverland where it's only kids together here, it's only peers, uh, one founder, one vote. Uh, we make decisions by consensus. Lots of metaphors that we uh, use within uh, the founding team of we're living in Neverland to be going and doing it. Um, neither of those is a great model to go with. Each of them has flaws of the sole decision maker and then the, um, the, the everyone on board in the decision making. This one turns into gridlock, this one turns into a lot more tension because you punted on how are we gonna go and break the gridlock or make decisions. Um, and then the other one, the Zeus atop Mount Olympus, you're betting on the monarch being infallible. And that's a very hazardous way to go and be doing it. Um, in between, the, one of the best models that I've seen, and this is where you have to go and design that team by checklist and then have it mapped to this, Tim Westergren was able to have mini Zeuses. So essentially, Tim was the Zeus over the music part of the company, and Will was the techie who was the Zeus over the techie part of the company. John was the one who was going and making the purely business decisions that he would have to go and consult with the other two because those are gonna be very intertwined with the business decisions. But that's where each of them could go and be playing to their strengths, be making those decisions quickly, being able to go and make them. But even when you have a great mini Zeus structure like what they had there, there's always gonna be cross-cutting decisions. 
There's always going to be one that are going to be a technical decision that depends on how you design the music genome, Tim. And the vice versa across all of these, the uh, ways in which you're going to have to go and have everyone at the table there. And that's where you're going to have to go and still deal with some decisions that are going to be there. But you're going to take a lot of the decisions, have people play to their strengths because they are specific to the different domains, have the mini Zeus's go and do that. And then you can go and be able to have the decisions that are going to be coalescing for everyone that are going to be the last things you're going to go and take a look at. One of the other key things they have to do, this is one of the things, so we can get into a question about two founder teams versus three founder teams. Um, uh, in general, there are pros and cons to each of those, and a lot of it should be driven by the checklist. Like a two founder team that leaves a gaping hole should have been a three founder team. Three founder team that has double check boxes and they could have covered it with two should have been, a, should have been the opposite. Um, and so you have to go and take a look at the specifics around it, and my data show that each of those, the two and three, have relatively equal performance there, and so you have to go and choose it right, but it's not that one is gonna be determining each of those. But one of the key things that's a minus for the two founder teams is what happens when you have those collective decisions that you're making, and it's 1-1. How are you gonna go and break that tiebreaker? That's one of the ones that leads to a lot of tension within those two, that duo over there. And unless they've gone and figured out ahead of time, like negotiated the process side, um, I think it was Daniel Patrick Moynihan who was talking about that every decision when it is that, in, when they're in Congress and they're making decisions, um, if at that point they are deciding on the process to get to an answer, it's all gonna be driven by the political side of it. Each side is gonna go and try to structure the process to get the answer that they want out of it. It has to be ahead of time before there's actual decisions to be made that then you talk about the process. You design the one of how we're gonna break ties and things like that. And so ahead of time, those two person teams have to figure out, is there gonna be a third leg on the stool that we're gonna introduce? Is there gonna be a key mentor that we both respect that is gonna be enough in touch with the business and has better vision about what is ahead because they have a little bit more experience there who can then weigh in and be able to be that tiebreaker vote or something like that. That's just one of the examples how, how to go and set it up ahead of time versus the three founder team with if Tim and Will and John were going and it can be a two to one vote that can go and break that tie and have them move forward with it. Um, and so that's where you're getting into the collective decisions and the structure of the team. Mini Zeus's who then have a process for being able to resolve any kind of ways in which there is gridlock at the top with the other decisions. What well, was interesting just to this point in um, Life as a Startup, you talked about the CEO of Segway. So he gave up control. Uh, he wasn't the CEO, but he still basically controlled everything and everyone and went through, I think, nine CEOs. Nine in a decade. Yeah. So I, I think if you're going to you know, give your co-founders the, the room for them to grow and make decisions, you have to kind of let go a little bit. Yeah, I don't know if we have to get into it, but there's obvious mapping to the family life. Yeah, about the, definitely. The, the problems within the couple when you have that kind of a person who's, who's part of it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is something I think that I get virtually on, an, on, a, on a daily basis, and this is the, the third of your three R's, which is the rewards, uh, splitting the pie. So we've identified we, we're not going to be rich. Um, we, we're not going to be king, but we're going to be rich. Uh, we've made all the right decisions in that regard, but, but probably you know, one of the hardest things, and especially if it's either strangers or, or people that you've worked with in the past, is splitting the pie because it really goes to the very essence as to why we're actually getting involved in the startup, and for the most part, it's to create you know, wealth and hopefully multi-generational wealth. So um, let's talk about some of the things that founders should be thinking about as they're splitting the pie, or maybe they've split the pie and they've kind of found out that uh, they, they didn't do it you know, quite right. What, in your mind, separates a good equity split from a bad one? Okay, so uh, very complex domain. Let's see if we can boil it down a bit. Um, what should the equity split be going and doing? It should be doing a little bit of rewarding the past. It should dominantly be incenting the future. And it should be going and being robust to those potholes in the road, the unexpected, um, that uh, things that are going to come up there. Um, you could have it meet the first two tests, but if it is static, if it is just set in stone, and then it's going to be a lot more like that fragile agreement that you, you pitch the spouse and then it comes crashing down when you hit a bump in the road. Same thing with those equity splits. This gets back into Mark Zuckerberg. What was the problem? 70-30 split that was set in stone. And then when he decides that Eduardo isn't worth it, he's going to go and grab it back from him. 
that static split came back to haunt him. Ended up in court, like all sorts of ways in which that was problematic for him. And uh, that's where you are missing, if you're missing any one of those pieces, but in particular the robustness to those changes, it's almost a given that something will be changing and that during those rosy early days, you're going to be neglecting to look at those potholes. And that's where you're going to go and do a split that is very much something we can get to right now and is not going to last throughout the bumps in the road. And so if you can go and have one that goes, and there's a fourth piece of it for especially the non-idea founder who's having to attract people, that the equity split is also going to have the attraction side, but the rewarding the past, the incenting the future, and robust to the changes along with the attraction piece of it are the ones that I am looking at and what their data show are the ones that are going to be much more robust equity splits. A key problem is when we get into the human biases, when we get into the natural inclinations that we have, we already talked about the rosy perspective on it. You're going to neglect to look at those potholes and plan around them, robustness test your equity split to see is it going to be robust to the potholes. Um, even if you go and think about the minuses, the, the pitfalls and things like that, that's going to be those difficult conversations that you're going to avoid having. Those are going to be the tension-filled things of talking about, well, what, I'm worried that you're going to drop out of this venture because you've never found it before and you're not ready for the days when the world is going to be falling in on us. Like, uh, those doubts that you might have, you're not going to go and bring that up with your co-founder. And so that's the second of the inclinations. Or look at the rosy. Even when there's the pitfalls along the way, you're not going to go and discuss them. There's not going to be the dialogue about the toughest pieces of it. And then last piece of it is there's this magnetic pull that we tend to have towards equal, towards quote unquote fair with equal being a proxy for it. Um, and that's the thing that leads to the most common of the equity splits. My data show that teams tend to punt on it by having the one over n rule. So the 50-50 split or the third, a third, a third if it's three of them. And to do it statically. And when you're going and doing that, that's where the rosy is ruling, the pitfalls are neglected, the robustness isn't there. And so there's all sorts of ways in which you are asking for it when you're going and splitting the equity there. So you, you mentioned uh, biases. Um, what, you know, what rules of thumb or biases get in the way of, of founders splitting the equity well? What, what's, what's your take on that? So those are the three, the main ones, the, the rosiness, the avoidance of the conflict. This is also echoes, this should be echoes of all of these pieces because they're human elements of the going and founding with friends. You're only going to look at it when we're the kumbaya team, that's rosiness. We're not going to go and discuss the difficult pieces there. And it's likely that we're going to have succumbing to the, the, the magnetic pull of equality that across all of the R's, the relationships, the roles, the living in Neverland is the, right. the, 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 the pull towards the, uh, towards the equal, that we're not going to discuss a bunch of the, you're, I have doubts about whether you're going to scale. Uh, all sorts of other things that are going to cause problems with the roles and not discussing the, the pitfalls there, and then the rewards. We talked about uh, all of those pieces of it. Um, but what I've found, so this is a, some of a very simple process, but what I've found much more effective for teams to deal with across all of these is essentially about a half a dozen steps to go through to go and collectively be able to go and decide on these things. And so what I tell my students when they're going co-founding or when I have people coming to me or are already running into problems and they want to know how to go with it, um, not rocket science or anything like that, but uh, the, this, uh, this process to go through, I tell them go and take a blank whiteboard. This is helping from a strategic planning and from the people perspective also. On that whiteboard, go and brainstorm about what are all the critical things that we need to go and succeed at this. And usually they'll end up, sometimes they get a little bit too detailed. Some say there's, they're only ending up with two or three things on the list and things like that. Usually it's about 12 to 15 things that they're going to come up with. Of These are the critical skills or contacts, like the, the human capital, the social capital, even the financial capital, things like that. What are the things that we need to go and succeed? Once you have that on the board, go and figure out what is the horizon when we're going to need this. Is this right at the beginning? Is this six months from now or so? When are the times that we're going to go and need this? And then once you have those up there, then go and start having a dialogue about how critical are each of these to overall what we're going to, the value that we're going to go and be able to create. And so then you're putting, essentially, could be a high, medium, low in terms of the crit criticality. Could be percentages that people could even go and do if it's engineers, that they have that attraction doing something in that direction. Um, that once you go and have those on there, then start going and checking off and putting the names next to it of who is already a given on this team who's able to go and cover those ba that base. Go and start checking off all of those pieces of it. And then once you have that, then you're ready to have some of those difficult dialogues. First of all, where do we have double check boxes and how are we going to deal with that homophily? 
How are we going to be able to go and structure it to not go and have that introduce tensions because we succumbed to it? For the unchecked boxes, what are the ways in which we have strategic plans to go and fill that check-in? If you have something that was on your important list and you don't have a solution to it, you have to collectively go and be able to figure out how are we going to be able to go and check that off. And this is where we get into some of the other options besides the, uh, the extremes when it comes to the co-founding ones. Maybe we get it through an advisor. Maybe we get it through outsourcing. Maybe we get it you know, through having all sorts of other mid-range solutions for that, but having some concrete way to go and check that box off. And then once you have those in place, then you can, so that's the roles pieces of it. You can go and be able to have the dialogue about uh, all those things that are there. You have the homophily part of the rewards that's coming out of that. You have the roles piece of how you're going to be able to go and see who is doing what and therefore what titles seem to make the most sense for them. And then on the rewards side, whoever's name are next to these, you can take it. So I started life as an engineer. That's why I uh, come into having this structured uh, approach, unfortunately, to a lot of these things. But right there, the engineering approach to it is go and take the names and the percentages of the things that they're going and doing and then go and add up. How much does that lead to their creating of this full pie of 100% of value? How much are they gonna be creating if they come through at each of those stages with doing those things? And that should be the starting point for your going and having a dialogue about what the equity split might be. You have to then go and robustness test across scenarios. So we are not scaling well. We're gonna to have to bring someone else in. So therefore, it's gonna be a different amount of the percentage that we're gonna have there. Or this is the most likely uh, way in which a pivot might be affecting what this landscape is going to look like. Look at those different scenarios. See what robustness testing the, uh, that is going to lead to. But at least gives you a starting point for the dialogue around each of these three R's and a structured way to have at least an initial cut before the fisticuffs start around the negotiations around who is doing what and how much they're worth. So I, I want to just you know, bring in a practical example. And I, I got permission to do this. I'm not going to mention any names. But I'd like to get your take on this. I, I have certain views. Um, three founders of a, of a software company, um, and they're asking me for advice on splitting the pie. They've worked together for a while uh, at a previous company. Now they've worked together for, for a while at the startup, and they're, they're splitting the pie. So this is what, the, um, what was suggested. So the CEO idea and partial money person, 44%. Um, engineering, VP engineering, 37%, and VP ops, 19%. And um, so, you know, you've studied pie splitting a lot and, and people that, uh, you know, where there's more success or failure. So as you sort of think through this split, what, what, what's your gut feeling? Obviously, you don't, you don't know the individuals, you don't know everything that they're bringing to the table, but I didn't know either when, when, when I was asked the question. But what's your take? So, ad hoc, we could do a case study right here. And I'll cold call a few. Well, of we've got a professor here, you know. <laughs> I get to be cold called on this. Um, what type of company is it? Uh, SaaS company. Software. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, first off, you were saying that they've been working on this startup a little bit. Probably is, about a year. Okay. So, uh, one of the key things that's great to go and date each other in the real startup to be able to go and learn about a bunch of those things. And so, that's one thing in there to the advantage of what they're going and doing. But unfortunately, it also misleads you about now we know each other and now it's all set for the future. And that's going to lead them to underestimate a bunch of those pitfalls. So, um, uh, one of them very possibly is going to have some personal issue that's going to lead that person to go and drop out of the startup. There might be some of the tensions around, they have the high personal burn rate still and they can't keep going without getting a paycheck and other things like that. And they're gonna be thinking, we're all set on the team, we're all, you know, th this is gonna continue with it, they're gonna be overconfident that, uh, from that. And so there's a balance there, you have to make sure you've gotten to know each other but you're not neglecting where this is likely to go. When you're talking about a SaaS startup, this is not rocket science to be able to go and do that from a technical side, not anymore. It was when SaaS you know, was first coming up and things like that. To go and have the techie have that huge a chunk of the company, um, we have to go and take a look at when we're looking at the percentages on the critical things for us to go and do there. Have we over allocated to that because it's not bleeding edge rocket science that we're gonna be doing there? Is that gonna mean we have less to be able to go and do some of the other things that are the critical parts of the unchecked boxes that we're gonna have there. And so over allocating to uh, one or more of those people, the, you're talking about VP operations, that's, I don't know what that person would be doing during the early days of a SaaS company that's gonna be different from uh, like what the CEO should be driving there at that point. And so um, when you're going, talking about that, is that person really, is this where we have a co-founder who needed a title 
And let's just go and throw that at the person, or is it a legitimate need within the company to be going and doing that? Well, well, and at early stage startup, I mean, uh, do, they, do they necessarily need a COO? I mean, what, what's your experience in terms of having that kind of individual? A lot of times it's a red flag for me when I see, A, that the founders all have COO, C, C-level titles, um, a, there's that title inflation that we were talking about a little bit before. What happens when the CFO, who has never done anything that is strategic on the financial side, they've been nothing more than a bookkeeper at most, uh, they can balance their checkbook and they can balance the company's early checkbook, but it's not gonna scale. So suddenly now, this person who's in love with having a C-level title is gonna fight giving it up. So you're gonna go and hire an SCFO, a senior <laughs> CFO to be above that person, like uh, all sorts of challenges that that's gonna go and introduce. Same thing on the, if you go and overtitle that person um, the, in the engineering side, now you're bringing in a true CTO above that person. Well, that person's already CTO. How are you gonna be able to go and do that? So being able to make sure that you're not gonna get hamstrung by, you're talking about all of them are VPs or C-level, that could become a, an issue there. Um, another one of them from that founder's perspective, so you're talking about the idea person with the 44% is gonna be the CEO. And also, I think there was also a funding element of it that that person bring funding to it. That's a lot more than 44% probably. The, like without knowing that person and the other things that are going on there, that person's wearing multiple hats in terms of the financing and the CEO and bringing the idea, all those other things there. Um, and that person essentially has a minority stake right now. So if you have, this is getting very Machiavellian, but you've seen, I'm sure, founding teams, I've seen them where that person's outvoted by the people who own the 56% of the company that that person doesn't own, and that's gonna be major problems for uh, the, being able to have decisions made that are healthy for the company and for the founder and things like that. Um, and so all of those are um, uh, ones that are the initial things that I go and uh, be able to see. And then the final one is, I assume this is set in stone, this is the 44, and no matter no, what comes, No, the, we've been talking about it. Uh, but what they would have done without you. Yeah. I assume it would have been a lot more of the static type of split that they I would have done so. without the so. expert guidance. Yeah. And so then they're not planning around a whole bunch of those other problems that are gonna be the unknowns that they should be able to anticipate with a little bit of guidance. And so it's missing that big critical robustness piece that we were talking about. Yeah, you know, I hate to always be bad guy, but I think that ultimately the wrong equity split um, it doesn't end up well just because I think uh, I think it was Zynga right before they went public. Um, basically, uh, Pinkers sent around letters that said, "Give back your equity or you're fired." And I was just absolutely incensed. I went to our labor and employment people and I said, "This is impossible. How can he do that?" And they said, "California is an at-will state. You can hire fi you know, fire someone for any reason or for no reason. Give back your equity. No, you're fired." Um, and, and really, we're, I think it was just a misallocation at the early stages. Going, going public, they couldn't increase the pool for option E's because they couldn't dilute the investors. And so it was the only way out just because of a bad allocation at the very early mm -hmm. stages. That's another rich and king founder yeah. who was skating on very thin ice because of a lot of early decisions that were not the head informing the heart as he's going and making them. So I, you know, we, we, we're, we've got so much to cover in so little time. Um, but I, I want to get your take on this because I get this you know, all the time as well. You know, a couple of founders, been in business uh, a couple of years, and you know, someone wants to come on as a co-founder. They want the title of co-founder. In, in reality, they really are uh, an early employee. And, and I've I, I got a friend in, in um, Southern California who started uh, ProFlowers. They sold for you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to Liberty Media, and every time I would invite, introduce him, Bill Strauss, the, C, the uh, founder of, of ProFlowers, and he'd say, actually, Roger, I was employee number one. You know, in his mind, mm. Jared's, it was Jared's idea, and, and he really kept it real. But that's rare humility that, yeah. that he's bringing to it. Yeah, but but let's say that that um, you know, you're working at this, you want to attract someone, and they say, "Well, come on," but we want the the, the co-founder title. They really are an early employee. But what's your take on giving them that that title? So, in some ways, I find that doing it in the right way, with the right framing, the right expectations, it can actually be a, a good thing to go and do. Um, in some ways, you're looking at the full package of how do I attract this person, and if for them, this is where you have to also read some of the signals and understand the person. If for them, it's very attractive to have the, the co-founder title there, and that enables you to not have to give up 
a lot of the equity, as much of the equity, if it enables you to go and make it a sweetened package for them, they'll give up a little more salary, and that way not go and kill your burn rate by going and bringing them on. If they're a key member of the team, that they're gonna be adding something to it. Then going and as long as you are grappling yourself with, I'm not the only one who's gonna be listed as founder on the site, and things like that, then that can be a way to go and sweeten the package. There was, uh, there was a co-founder, a founder I know, who was very clearly the founder, but when I looked at the first 10 of his employees, I think it was him as employee number one, and then three, seven, and 10 were also listed as founders. Like when I look at the dates that they're joining. And so I went and asked him about that. And he said, A, there was a bit of the sweetening the package for them, and B, that for him, he also felt that when a person is helping start a new part of the company, that that person really is doing founder kind of work that he's going and doing. So the first salesperson, who is gonna be going the pioneering part of the company, maybe is employee number 10, but he is going and founding a function. He is going and doing some real risk taking that he's taking on, and he's going and creating the crank rather than turning the crank that's already been created. There's a lot of things that are uh, really founder-ish about what that person do, past person's doing, and if going and having the founder title is gonna be able to enable me to get that real person on board, um, then that's one of the things that he was going and making as a trade-off there. That's where it goes and, uh, has to have with the eyes open about, is this gonna be a person gonna be driven by the ego? Um, is this a little bit of a signal, this person loves the founder title because of an ego reason, or is it because of some other thing that's going on there? Is it that this person is expecting, because he's a co-founder, he's gonna have a bigger equity stake rather than a lower equity stake that I can save it for other people? Like reading some of the other nuances there about whether there are minuses to it. So as you've gone and done that, then overall being able to sweeten the package with that, if your ego as the initial founder can go and handle it, can be a plus. Yeah. I think that that's, that's part of the challenge in really setting the expectations properly, because because um, especially in the Valley, having the status of, of co-founder, it's great for the resume, you know, if the company does well. It, but, but at the end of the day, I think some of the challenges are if the company is really sort of deep into, you know, by a couple of years and giving someone the status of co-founder, but them not thinking that they're co-equals, yeah. then they really may not be. And I think it just goes to sometimes you have to have these hard conversations up front and having the, the title doesn't necessarily mean that now we're all gonna rule by consensus. Yeah, um, up front and then reiterating it as we talked yeah. about. It can't just be a one-time thing. It has to be a revisiting on a very regular basis. So, uh, you know, I, I definitely wanna talk about some of these other dilemmas and, and, and one is um, the invested dilemmas. So for everybody in the room here, I would imagine at some point, if not now, they're gonna be looking for money. And what type, in, in your mind, as you looked at all these, these uh, startups and, and the stats, what types of investors um, should the entrepreneurs be targeting and at different stages of growth? And in your experience, what challenges are these in investors gonna introduce into the company? Okay, so we can go back to your original question about the, uh, the rich versus king decisions that founders are going and making. Um, uh, Sometimes you don't have any forks in the road to worry about. Like if you uh, are trying to really go and raise money or not able to, um, then that's gonna go and lead you to uh, one of those choices. You're gonna remain much more king on the throne than if you got and raised. We're assuming there that you have the option to go in that direction. That's where you have to go and have that self-awareness about my business, its needs, and my, what I'm gonna celebrate at the end of the day and the other decisions I made of how they inform it because Regardless of which of those you are, rich or king, if you make the opposite decision than you should, it's gonna go and get you into trouble. And so the person who's more the king, he goes out and raises outside money, that's gonna come back to, to bite him. If it's someone who very much has the option to go and raise or not, and they're rich oriented, but they, for whatever reason, go the king route, that's gonna have them ruining the day that they didn't get the rocket fuel to go and grow a faster growing company, to go and invest a lot of more in the resources to be able to hit this market window. They don't go and take those resources, they have to bootstrap, it's gonna be a lot slower to develop. They're in some sectors where there is a race, where there is a, a current market opportunity, then making that financing decision is gonna go and kill off the entire venture because you, you missed that window there. And so fitting it to that is gonna be one piece of it. This is where you also have a bunch of those mid-range options. So are you gonna go and, and this is also, let's go back to the checklist part. So say that you have everything checked off except the money piece of it. Then you can go with the investors who, what they're bringing to the table is just the green money 
and they're not, they, they don't have contacts in the industry, they don't have the pattern recognition of where things are likely to go, you don't need their mentorship. You are armed to be able to go and do all of these things yourself and it's just the money that you need. Then having that fit within the checklist happens to be a very good fit there. If you have critical holes that you're missing, then an investor can be a great way to go and fill those holes if it fits in with what they're bringing to the table. And so if what you're missing are a whole bunch of industry contacts, go and find someone who specializes in that industry, can leverage their contacts, and brings the money, and you're leaving a lot of potential creation of real value on the table if you go with the person who doesn't have any contacts, but they just bring the green dollar to it. Yeah, so it has to go back to the checklist view of it. Yeah, I think that's one of the, one of the things that I see consistently that founders make, um, make a mistake on, and that's looking solely at pre-money valuation. Um, looking for the investors that will give them the highest pre-money valuation, as opposed to where they can get a reasonable pre-money valuation and also really get the value add that, that comes along with a great investment. Yeah, the more solid yeah. checklist that they're gonna have. So a lot of times you get that big pre-money valuation early on from someone who's not gonna be able to help you fill out your checklist. Yeah. A, you are gonna not have as much value creation going forward to the next uh, th to the next milestone, the next time you're gonna need money. And so it'd be much harder for you to go and do it. And also if you get that much higher valuation, you're gonna have very difficult conversations about why this is gonna be a down round for us because actually it's gonna be a lot worse in terms of the terms, in terms of all the other things that went to it because you did a very, you got your dream in the first, this gets into, uh, so in Life of a Startup, I talk about the perils of success. Now you're going to succeed at raising that great round, this is in the entrepreneurial sector, but we have all sorts of other examples from personal life, of not planning for the success scenario and what that's gonna introduce. You're gonna raise that great round at a high valuation and it's gonna come back to haunt you the next round if you have not brought on the right people and you're not able to get a valuation that's, that's going up from there. And so that's where being able to understand the checklist, what's gonna to take to create the value, and the longer term path down the road of how this is going to set the table or cause problems for the table. Those are the things that have to go into that. So I, I wanna be able to give people uh, an opportunity to, to ask questions, but um, I, I wanna just ask you a question on, on something that's a really touchy subject for for well, founders in general, and that, and that deals with founder succession. <clears throat> One of the things that I think was <clears throat> sort of counterintuitive to me when I read your book initially and kind of rereading it again now, was that founders that you know, do really well at the early stages of the startup's existence are more likely to be replaced than you know, just average, mediocre uh, founders. And I, I, I'm sure everyone sitting in the room here tonight um, is thinking, I'm going to absolutely kill it. I'm going to, you know, get traction, traction, traction. And based on the data, based on your research, they are more likely to be replaced as CEOs for doing an excellent job. So, totally counterintuitive, and maybe you could just ex you know, explain why um, this really is based on, on the data. No, absolutely. This is a perfect example of what we talked about before, where by my being out there in the field and having experienced it myself also, that I realized that academia was asking exactly the wrong questions. What academia was looking at was succession within the Fortune 500, the core the uh, core finding, the core result within that, is that success breeds entrenchment. Like there's no way that person is gonna replace, be replaced as CEO unless they wanna go and be replaced. And what I was finding out there in the field was that some of the founder CEOs who I was most impressed with the job they'd been doing until then were the ones who were getting replaced the fastest. And when I went and got the data on it and did the analyses, event history analyses, pretty uh, rocket scientist type of things, that's what came right out of the data. And a lot of the things that I had experienced and then was seeing in the field were a bunch of the answers to how can we go and see that? And what I called that was the paradox of entrepreneurial success. You go and you fail, you're gonna get replaced. You go and succeed, you're gonna get replaced. Succeed smashingly, like at the other end of it. And you're right that in the mid-range that is gonna be less so. And there's several things that come from that. One of them is that how did you get that very fast success? A bit of it was with the rocket fuel that you went and raised. When you go and raise that rocket fuel from investors, the money that you need to go and grow a fast growing company, invest in the, uh, in the development and go and build the team, other things along those lines, you're giving up board seats. And so let's go, let's use as an example that we talked about already, Lou Cerny with Wiley. Lou, by what was heading into the third round, had given up three out of the five board seats. And it's at that point that they said, Lou, you're out of here. Lou no longer controlled that because he had taken the rocket fuel. 
the way they got them financed and gotten a whole bunch of that fast growth was through bringing in the investors. The other side of it was Lou had a technical background in ACE Techie, had worked for Hummingbird and Apple, and really honed his skills there. He was perfect for the technical stage of the company, developed the product, led them through even a pivot, like the key ways in which there's really intense, even the fact that you realize as a founder that there's a need to pivot is something through your passion that you can go and be able to see that, and then to lead them to version 2.0 and then be able to go and sell it from that point on. At that point, he has to go and build a company. At that point, you have to go and do a bunch of function building that you've never worked in that function. Um, Lou, so how many people here, um, anyone here ever interviewed salespeople <laughs> to go and see if you're gonna hire them? Can you tell, especially if you've never worked in sales, you know, those of you who are techies like Lou, how well can you tell, how well do salespeople interview? Has any salesperson ever interviewed badly, <laughs> even the worst of them? So how well, as Lou, are you gonna be able to tell whether this is the person you wanna bring in to start building your sales team? Lou had to go and buy his first suit to go and make a customer call. That shows you how much he had not gone and done sales. And so this is where he's, this is just one function he had him worked in where he's gonna have real trouble being able to go and see, now I have to go and build a sales team, I'm gonna be able to go and do that well or not. Then you have all the other functions they had not worked in. That's where you have a qualitative change in the challenges that the company is facing and therefore what the CEO is needing to go forward with it. And so what I find when it comes to the, the quantitative results and also being out there in the field, each round of financing that they're going and raising, when the investors have the most say over who's gonna be able to remain CEO, you need their check, you're running on fumes, that's when they're gonna be able to go and have the most pull about going and changing it. And when you go and complete product development and now have to do company building, both of those, the chances that the founder CEO is gonna get replaced go up dramatically. Within our startups, we celebrate those. You've been going and living for 24 seven for a long time on ramen noodles, not knowing if there's any there there, whether this product's ever gonna be developed, and now we complete product development. What's the first thing you go and do? Throw a party to celebrate. <laughs> you go and raise a round of financing, and now we can actually go and buy something better than ramen. Now we actually can go and see the certification of having a stamp of approval that some objective person is putting on this venture. And yet, we go and celebrate those. What are we actually marking? That the chance that the founder CEO is gonna get replaced are going to go up dramatically. That's what the, the quantitative and also my field results show from Lou and other examples and things like that. At each of those events that are the celebrations, that the chance because you raised the rocket fuel, because you completed that stage that you were perfect for and are now heading to a brand new stage, those successes are a breed the need for, at least from the investor perspective, for a new person there and now they have the ability to go and make that change within the venture. Just, uh, you know, I wanna get a, a, a pulse here. After the third round of financing, um, I, I, I sort of looked at this percentage and I, I found it hard to believe. What percentage of the CEOs have been replaced, do you think, after the third round of financing? Just 50? 75? Uh, I think according to, to you, Noam, it was about 52%. Um, so the, the, after the first round, a quarter were replaced, um, and after the third round, about you know, more than half. And some of the things, and I just want to you know, touch on this because I think it really is, is important, um, about 73% of the, the re removals were board initiated, so it wasn't voluntary. But one of the things that I found really interesting was when a CEO um, essentially puts in place a succession plan for themselves, I think they're far more likely to be on the board and they're far more likely to have an executive position w w within the company. You know, this is really hard for the fearless leader to be giving up, you know, their, their proverbial baby. But, you know, what, what words of advice can you give to the, the entrepreneurs here tonight? They're taking the rocket fuel, their, their skills may be outstripped by the pace, and they may have to bring in Eric Schmidt you know, at some point to really uh, you know, bring in that, that professional CEO. But how do you do this? When, when should you start thinking about it? And how do you do it in a way that, it, that isn't going to be sort of the end of the culture or, or really disruptive to the company when their fearless leader is, is you know, put out to market? Mm -hmm. So your question about what to do about it, there is when it is possibly in the range of happening, and then there's what you can do way before. Let me tackle yeah. the first, and then I'll get to the other piece of it. So the... 
What are you going to do about it? You're highlighting that data, that difference of who is pulling the trigger and that it leads to a real difference in whether that parent of the baby is still going to be able to remain uh, in some kind of real role with the baby. Um, that's where a bunch of that self-awareness at two levels is a critical thing to have. And so A, there's the self-awareness about the road ahead. Where are things likely to go? What are the changes going to be and what the CEO's challenges are? And then the self-awareness about me, my strengths, my weaknesses, and whether they match each of those next stages of it. The ability to go and think through those, having the map ahead when, you have it, when you're a first-time founder or you've never gone that far in a venture is one that you have to go and be able to get from being able to see the, whether it's uh, a mentor who's painting it for you, reading it in a book, or something like that, be able to understand the road ahead, and then the self-awareness to project yourself into there. There's two elements to be able to watch within that. There's the can and there's the want. The can is the skills, the capabilities, do I have those? And the want side, what do I like to go and do? And the people who get in trouble is where you have a divergence between the two of them. What I want to go and do is something I'm not good at, or vice versa, that you have the disconnect between in the other direction in terms of the can and the want, where you have the two of those line up that what I want to do is what fits what the company needs, then I can keep going with it if I am the can because I'm able to go and execute on it. But then once the can isn't there, even if I want it, that's going to be problematic for my being able to have it come to its full potential, for my being able to key, play a key role within it. Then that's where you have to go and get a little bit more of that self-awareness around it. Watching for this job has a lot of painful parts that I didn't anticipate. We've gone beyond the technical challenges that I loved, and now there's a lot of those other company building pieces that are really a drain on me. I can't do any of the technical stuff that I love because of it. That's where you have to have a bit of that awareness that let me go and refocus on the stuff I love. Let me maybe go and step into what Lou ended up stepping into, the CTO role. Now, if the techie was able to go and be able to lead the, 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 the visioning and the product planning and things like that, hand off the painful parts to an experienced CEO who the can and the want are right there for that person. And that's where it's going to be a lot better for being able to go and have it be a smooth one. We can go and step back. This is where I'm wishing for the first time that I have a whiteboard here. Uh, you want me to go and this is back to the really, beginning of it. You know, Sam, could you maybe just tell the driver um, outside? <laughs> Sam, Ellis. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just let the driver know we're going to be about 10 minutes late. OK. Um, so but, yeah, let's go to the next yeah, one. Well, I really <laughs> want to ask, you know, want to give people an opportunity to ask them some questions. Um, Eli, do you have the mic? Yes, I do. Excellent. Questions, questions for now. Right here, Eli. Hello. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. And if, if we could try and keep it short, the question, so that we can give a couple of people. All right, quick. Sorry, I've gone long for the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say your goal is to be the king and being the rich isn't the big concern in a practical way, in order to avoid mistakes and future regrets. I think one part of it is as a founder to be educated and you know what the hell you are doing. And like, would you recommend to like talk to some um, attorneys or like legal firms and tell them what are your priorities and then have them to, uh, uh, advise you? Is that the best way to? So uh, in general, founder is the loneliest job in the world. Like, there's no peer support if you're going forward with it. In a lot of ways, you have a, a bunch of people. If you've gone and built a board or something like that, you've got a bunch of people above you. If you built a team, you've got a bunch of people below you. You're at the middle of that hourglass all alone going and grappling with those things. And especially if you're a solo founder that you don't have uh, anyone to go to, you have to go and build that peer support network. Uh, one of the things we started within my center, uh, within Founder Central, we, I do a bunch of founder boot camps to educate founders about a whole bunch of these pitfalls along the way. And said, we want to go and have a solution to your being alone when you're grappling with things going forward. So we went and created founder forums to be able to go and bring six to eight of them together on a monthly basis to go and have that advice, go and have those outside eyes to be able to go and bring the peer outside knowledge of uh, being able to go and help each other in that realm. When you're going and looking at what's the checklist where I'm missing things, the peers might be able to give it to you. Sometimes they don't have the, uh, the knowledge of the road ahead if they're first timers within that. Then you might have to go to professionals or to your advisors, build your own personal board of advisory if you don't have an official board. Go and take a look at the missing pieces of my checklist, and now how can advisors fit into that? Who is someone who knows this domain who can go and check that? By my having, let me treat you to lunch once a month. 
Let me go and have ways in which I can go and drink in your whatever is going to be attractive to them to go and spend some time with you. Go and very actively take the unchecked boxes and have that drive. Who is the missing pieces that I have to go and use to build my board or bring to my peer group other ways that you're going to be able to, as a solo founder, be able to get that outside experience for you? Thank you. Thank you. If I want to purchase one or both of your books for a number of my clients who are founders, CEOs, startups, should it be both? Should it be the first? Should it be the second? So uh, if, they are, if they are purely founders and they want to have this roadmap and be able to reflect on a bunch of the things that Roger's been talking about that founders go and face, just go with the first one. If it's people who uh, they can benefit from learning lessons from founders for a bunch of other walks of life, or even founders who want to be able to have that inform the other things that they're doing in life, shifting gears at any of the inflection points, or going and crafting a much more solid relationship at home, um, being able to go and have a bunch of those lessons to them, then that's where the second book fits in there. Um, one of the key things that I had realized um, is that in a lot of ways, these human issues, the reasons we can go and learn lessons from founders, it's not to say that every founder is infallible when it comes to this. Far from, for, from, far from that. Um, but when it comes to these human issues, founders are facing them very often in a very intense situation. And to the extent that they have to go and can't band-aid over them, can't just go and find quick solutions, and it'll last until a year from now when they face the next one of these, they have to go and find some real solutions that often tend to be counterintuitive, a bunch of the things that we've talked about where it's the opposite of what the gut would tell you and things like that. For those types of things where we can see what are the best practices that they have honed, that's where we can then go and be able to learn it for the human issues that we face outside of founding. And so for the people who it's the outside of founding that they can learn from founders, that's where life as a startup is meant for them. But if they're purely founders and they just want to know at the startup how they can go and do it better, then it's from the first one. Thank you. Uh, Actually, we had a question over here. Ah. Uh, congratulations, great presentation and discussion. Yeah. So quick questions, do you think there is little science or little academia behind startups, behind founders, because what we say, okay, Elon Musk did that, Larry Page did, do, did this, and we have a feeling that with this, this presentation here, there's, there's a lot of hard science that maybe it, it doesn't come out in the magazines as it should be. So we're never gonna be able to fully arm founders for everything they're gonna be able to go and face. That doesn't mean that we should go and try to arm them with as much as we've been able to learn about where they are likely to go and heighten the risk rather than heightening the potential of their ventures. And the last 20 years worth of our being able to study these things have enabled us to take several things off the list that we can go and arm people with. Uh, we don't go and send a chemist into the lab and say to that person, just mix chemicals and you'll figure out along the way what is the best way to go and do these things. <laughs> They've learned certain things about how to go and have them avoid certain parts that they can then go and be freed up to not worry about those blowing up on them so that they can be a lot more creative in their experimentation. Same thing's here, if we can go and take a lot of this knowledge about how to go and do these things better, you won't have that on the, uh, your worry list. You'll be able to go and be freed up to go and handle the things we can't go and prepare them for. And along the way also, so for instance, with all these difficult conversations that we've been talking about, with all of these being able to look at the pitfalls and plan around them, those are muscles that we have to go and build. Difficult conversation muscles, the ability to go and take failure and not recoil from it, um, the ability to go and take negative feedback and be able to see it as a blessing rather than a curse and things like that, those are muscles we have to go and build. If we can go and do that in these arenas that we've learned how to go and train you how to do that, you'll be much better suited of taking those muscles and applying them to other problems that we can't even anticipate right now to be able to go and exercise those muscles when it's really going to count. And so that's why let's take the best cut at educating people. There's a lot of a feeling founders, you have to dive in, you have to go and make mistakes. Making mistakes and failing is painful. We're never gonna be able to help you avoid all of it. Let's go and take some of it off the table and then how you go and deal with it will be much more productive for the things that we can't go and prepare you for. The one thing I will just say that I, I, I you know, over the thousands of startups that I've worked with, um, one of the things I always try and say is don't be a slave to convention. And I think that 
you know, very often I see people really not looking at their own startup and saying, you know, what's appropriate for my company? You know, you've got all the data, you've got the statistics, and you know, every company does this, therefore I have to do this. And it's, it's, it's really hard to really look inside your own company and say, what is appropriate for our team, for our company? Um, but something I absolutely think you should do. Uh, yeah. Let's say uh, you get some uh, co-founder, uh, let's say you give them 40% or something. Then later on, you hate it. And you're like, why did you know? Not only that, there's maybe an investor that wants 30%. So you have to convince them that, you know, well, I, need to, I need you to give up 30% of your share too. No, this is one of those really tough things. So let's spray it out, especially with the human issues. There are mistakes you're going to make that you can, you can hit the undo key on. Ones that you can go in reverse, it's not that costly to go and do it. There are other ones where hitting the undo key is going to be really costly. And those are the ones that you have to focus on the most at the beginning of the road. How can I go and understand which are the ones that are going to be the stickiest, they're going to be the toughest to go and undo? And that equity split that you just talked about is one of those, where you need to have a lot more of the foresight. You have to be going and structuring it to begin with. Otherwise, you will end up having a movie written about you going and raking your co-founder over the coals as you try to grow and grab back the 30% that he got. So it fits right into that, uh, what we were talking about before with the, the static split and not understanding the perils around that. That is hard to undo. We talked about a whole bunch of things. Give someone a CEO title and they get in love with it. Going to be very hard to go in and do that. Several other things. This is also back to the, the life is a startup piece of it. What are the things in life where I'm going to go and hit the undo key and it's going to be really hard to go and do it? Think a lot harder about those. Date those options a lot more before you go forward with it. Your mother-in-law wants to come and move across the country to go and be living in your basement. You're going to go move her out of where she is right now, move her into where you are, that's a very different thing to go and hit the undo key on when you see that she actually thinks you're not parenting your kids well, and she's there daily to go and counter that, and there's loads of tensions there, compared to, let's go and date this a little bit. Mom, let's keep your apartment there. Let's have you come and visit us for two weeks instead of the usual one week. Let's go and ramp up on that. A lot easier to hit the undo key if you have gone and waded into the waters rather than took a dive into it and got rid of the beach. And so there's all sorts of ways in which you have to go and separate those out in life and in founding. And uh, whether you're going and doing it as equity splits or dramatic life inflection points, you have to go and be able to see that this is going to be an undoable thing that I should go and wade in a little bit better into it. I uh, apologize, but Noam is flying on the red eye to back to Boston. So um, I, I really I want to thank you, Noam. This no, thank been, you for organizing. Um, thank you, Michael, you know, for helping with it. Thank you, everyone, for coming.